and welcome to the Just Interesting podcast, the podcast that's not boring, it's not too interesting, it's just interesting enough. And this is a very special episode because we have a very special guest with us, and it's expert crime historian and Jack the Ripper expert as well, it's Richard Jones. Hi Richard, how are you? Good evening, I'm very well, thank you. Very good, very good. And so Richard, you joined us, when was it? It was the beginning of 2019, I think, on our, on our In Plain Sight episode about Jack the Ripper. And we went round Whitechapel with you and, um, and had, had a very special tour and made a video about it um, of, of all the murders. And so we're going to have a bit of a discussion about that later. Um, and in particular, looking at um, Mary Kelly, uh, the, the fifth um, Ripper, Ripper victim. Um, well, supposed fifth uh, Ripper victim, because it's coming up to the anniversary of when she was killed, I believe. That's it, 9th of November. Okay, okay. So we've got if, that coming if we're up. clever, we'll time this podcast <laughs> to go up at the, at the right moment. And fingers yeah, crossed, yeah, it'll, it'll not be. yet the 9th of November, but you know, we'll not, find out. I don't trust us enough to get it right, <laughs> but uh, we'll see, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. So before we get on to that, we'll be discussing what we've learned this week, some fun facts that we've learned this week. And, uh, and we'll also be ending this week's episode with a quiz as well. So mm. who wants to go first and let us know what they've learned this week? Uh, okay. Let's go for Alex. Do you oh. want to go first? Do you fancy? Uh, yeah, sure. What did I learn this week? I actually can't remember. Um, so that's good. <laughs> um, yes, I did learn something this week, actually. And I have a conspiracy theory for all of you. Mm. Mm, but here's, okay. my, here's my conspiracy theory, right? In the late medieval, uh, late Middle Ages, there were giant snails that attacked knights and, uh, and the knights fought them off in some kind of, uh, yeah, basically Earth was invaded <laughs> by giant snails and uh, this was a real threat to humankind. That's my conspiracy theory. For what is your, Wait, you what just is made your that up. Wait, that's not, what is saying this? things. I'm not making this up, Robin. This is the conclusion that I've come from, come to, having looked at a bunch of medieval manuscripts from around like the 13th, 14th century. Uh, okay. Where for some reason, there's loads of, <laughs> loads of drawings. And this is like all across Europe, like all across Europe in different yeah. manuscripts, drawings of knights battling giant snails. I'm, I wonder I if, I can, if I can share some of these images with you, actually. Please I mean, do, I've, if you can. Yeah. I've missed this. I, I can share a screen. Actually, I mean, can I, or will that mess everything up? No, go for it. It might, it might work. Richard, oh, giant snails. Um, what, are you, what are your thoughts? Do you think there's <laughs> any, uh, any basis for this in the Middle Ages? I've got loads of them in the back garden. I, I just can't, <laughs> keep, can't keep them at bay. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, yep. uh, Middle Ages, lot, lot, lots, of, lots of snails around in the Middle Ages. So, um, and they were probably bigger than everything, everything was bigger in the Middle Ages. So, I, I can believe it. <laughs> but that's because people were smaller, right? So, it, yeah. everything else <laughs> seemed bigger. Yeah. I mean, the, the snails were just average size, but the people were <laughs> <laughs> so tiny. Here, here you go. Can, you, can you see this? Yes. yes. Yeah. Look, Ooh. you got, you got snails. Alter. You got yeah. snails here. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Fighting sure. a, a snail here. What? What's with all this? Okay, there, there's. There is a surprisingly violent attitude towards the snails. There's, there's only two, a... there's only two in this article, but I swear, I swear yeah, there were no. more, and it's it's quite strange, and no one really can explain what this is about. So my conspiracy theory stands. Um, however, what we could be looking at here is it's just a running joke. It's just a running joke that us in the twenty first century can't really understand. Is it, some people suggest maybe it's a, uh, mm. a, uh, a dig, like, you know, you, the night's so slow, uh, uh, he's basically a snail, that kind of thing. Uh, a bit, and, a bit of comedy. Yeah. The, yeah. And there are some actual, what's thought to be parody drawings, where it's actually a rabbit fighting a snail. Okay. I okay, prefer so my theory. That is though. quite meta, that is, isn't it? A parody drawing of a joke drawing, taking the mickey out of nights. Yeah. So it might not have been an invasion. <laughs> it might not have been, Richard, but I'm choosing to believe that's what this is. <laughs> yeah. um, well, clearly we were successful, though, right? We were, yeah. Um, Those snails have nothing on us humans. Yeah. <laughs> I think salt that. works much better than a lance, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, very good, Only Alex. in the coastal so, areas where they had sea salt. <laughs> true, true. That was, that, so that's good, go. Alex. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know whether to believe that or not, but um, it's something to, you know, it's something to think about, isn't it? Could, could giant snails return? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> um, 
Richard, have you got anything interesting for us this week? I have. I discovered the on the the, the, the smallest cathedral in uh, probably in the world, but certainly in London, oh, yeah. is located on Vauxhall Bridge. Oh. On the bridge. Wow. Mm. How oh, big is it? Mm. I'm not going to say anything else about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's that's a tiny, <laughs> tiny <laughs> cathedral. Oh, um, would a walk... bit, would a giant snail fit in there? No, in fact, it, it was it was actually it's actually smaller than a giant. It's actually smaller than an ordinary snail. Uh, what? Oh, wow. it's a tiny, no, it's, it's probably a bit bigger, but it's a tiny little thing. I wish I had a photograph to show you, but if you walk over Vauxhall Bridge and look over the so coming from the north side going south yeah. on the right hand side of the bridge, if you look over the bridge on the about I think it's about the third pillar along, there's a miniature St Paul's Cathedral on the other side. Oh, oh I see. Oh, that's nice. fascinating. Oh, that's <laughs> cute. Yeah. So it's not, is it, is it actual, like a, like a three-dimensional recreation? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, oh, it's, right. it's an exact, yeah. cathedral. It's, a, it's a miniature version of St. Paul's. And it's, uh, and it's, uh, it's there, there, there over the parapet of uh, Vauxhall Bridge. I'm surprised right. no, I'm surprised no one's, yeah. no one's taken it and run off with it. We'd fall in, it, reaching for it's a bit difficult. Ah, uh, right. Oh, <laughs> okay. okay. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, I mean, done this. You can't worship there. You can't go in and have a, a quick prayer. You can't anyway now because they've locked down. But that, that true. <laughs> good that's point. True. Good point. True. Is this going to be on one of your tours, uh, Richard? It, it, it is. I've, I've, yeah. I'm, I've done a, I'm doing a blog. Well, I've done a blog about it. Uh, but no, I, it's. Uh, I, I'm taking this opportunity to go and film all over London. So I'll, I'll go and do that. So uh, yeah. So that's my fascinating fact of the day that uh, oh, nice. or the evening. Um, miniature Saint Paul. It's got nothing to do with Jack the Ripper. But, but, <laughs> that's all right. Neither do I. Fancy. I'm not sure if giant snails have much to do with Jack the Ripper. <laughs> well, I, don't, I don't know, Robin. I don't know. That's that's my fringe theory for the evening. <laughs> so, so Richard, how's um how's it been in lockdown with you? I, I take it you've had, you've taken the opportunity to go to places when it's nice and quiet and and be able to um to film and and do do some bits and pieces um during this time. It's been absolutely fantastic. Uh, that there's no better time to explore London than at the moment. Uh, I mean, you go around the, the city of London and on the, in the day, it's absolutely deserted. I mean, it's, <laughs> you know, you can go there Tuesday at midday when normally the pavements would be heaving and it's like Christmas day. There's just nobody there. Uh, and yeah. it's perfect. You can get places now, film places that you just wouldn't be able to have got uh, this time last year. So God bless uh. COVID, I say. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, Robin, I mean, do you, have, I mean, do you have anything to add to that, or do you have a, a fact, a fact um, of the week yourself? Well, I have both actually, because um, I just want to com- confirm that when we were filming with Richard, uh, our program about Jack the Ripper a couple of years ago, um, which maybe we'll do again sometime, that'd be nice to go to recreate that program. Um, there were some locations we were at which were just so awkward to film at with people, and uh, particularly people we had to avoid filming because of you know, legal reasons. Kids you know, at the school. You know, kids at the school in particular <laughs> we had to avoid. Sadly, the school was positioned right where the location was, so that was yeah. awkward. Um, but no, my fact of the week is, um, so recently I've been uh, having a look at the Bible, uh, the Old Testament, and um, uh, I'm, I'm going to mispronounce this because I can never quite say it. It's Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, yeah. You know, like the starship in uh, Matrix. Exactly, yeah, named after him. Uh, we've, all, we've all heard of him. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar II, king of Babylon, uh, often attributed with creating the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, a uh, possible wonder of the ancient world, um, although that's debatable, actually. Uh, historians aren't sure about that. But I learned this week that his name wasn't actually uh, Nebuchadnezzar, because um, sometimes in the Old Testament, his name is written as Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Nebuchadrezzar, not Neza. And okay. Nebuchadrezzar is actually very close to what his name would have been in Akkadian, uh, the language that the people of Babylon spoke at the time. Because, of course, the Bible was written, the Old Testament was written by the Hebrews in Hebrew. Um, so their version of his name in Akkadian was Nebuchadrezzar. But throughout the Bible, it's more commonly spelt as Nebuchadnezzar. And historians don't know why this is the case, but they suspect that it's actually a pun. Because if you, um, his name in Akkadian, because we've got Akkadian sources, uh, means um, God uh, protect my son, basically. His, his dad said, God protect my son. And that's what his name means. 
but and that's Nebuchadnezzar. But Nebuchadnezzar is more similar to the Hebrew, which means uh, God protect my jackass. Is, wow. <laughs> and, uh, given that Nebuchadnezzar conquered the Jews um, and infamously drove them out of Israel, it's probable that the Bible has, uh, that's a bit of propaganda that's lasted all the way until now. And we've accepted his name as God protect my jackass um, <laughs> instead of uh, God protect my son. So wow. that was what I learned this week. I just thought it was quite funny. That, yeah. uh, he's gone down in history as with, with a funny name. <laughs> When, yeah, you said that, when you said that his name was different than what yeah. it actually was, I was hoping it was going to be something like Steve or, or yeah, Jeff. Or Bert. <laughs> no, Bert. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it wasn't, uh, wasn't that interesting a fact. Sorry, this is just interesting. It was, uh, yeah, it was Bill. Yeah. <laughs> just Bill, yeah. yeah. Call me Bob. Uh, Martin, well, what's your fact? Well, my facts are a little bit of a letdown after that really interesting fact. It's quite short. But um, I learned this week that the, the tradition of leaving cookies and milk for Santa and carrots for, for his reindeer mm. um, actually dates back, you know, dates back to the, well, supposedly the earliest, early 20th century in America specifically. But it became a, a, a proper holiday tradition. It really came into its own during the Great Depression in the 1930s. Because, of course, everyone was suffering so much from, from, uh, well, from the hardships and unemployment and, and, you know, terrible things. And so a lot of parents were trying to teach their children the, the importance of giving to others to show gratitude for, for the gifts that they were lucky to receive on Christmas. So that's where this kind of really kicked off, the whole thing of, of giving um, cookies to Santa and, uh, and carrots to the reindeer. Oh, yeah. that's nice. That's, that is, that is nice. nice. Yeah, I thought... Yeah. Sorry, Roman. No, I, was gonna say, I thought that story was going a different direction. I thought you were saying that they would, <laughs> they're like, I don't know why I thought this. I thought they were homeless men dressing as Santa and going around and stealing people's cookies. That would be a better I, fact. I, I thought that's where that was going. <laughs> um, I don't know why, because I, mean, I don't know I, why. I, I, wish that was, I wish that was where I was going. That would be um, a, bit of, bit of a bit of an <laughs> intricate intricate grift for those homeless people to be doing dressing <laughs> dressing up as santa just for milk and cookies <laughs> yeah you could do it without dressing up plus people would just think it's a burglar anyway because you're you're just dressing up and breaking and entering into someone's house so that's true yeah. and there are more valuable things you could take than the milk and cookies <laughs> if you're gonna do it yeah that's the last mm-hmm. thing you want to take really isn't it good point good point. depends how much you like milk and cookies i mean the criminal like mind the criminal mind I wonder what the yeah. like. <laughs> what, what were what were the gifts like back then? People always say like you know they only got an orange in their stockings for Christmas. Like I wouldn't I wouldn't have traded milk and cookies for that to be honest. Yeah, but an orange was really expensive, right? Fruit was much more expensive back then, so it's like it's a proper treat, isn't it? I thought. Whoa! Well, yeah, uh, that I hadn't the origin of... considered that. Yeah. 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 Plus, they didn't, have, they didn't have slinkies. Yeah. I remember when I was a kid, get, that's, you know, you'd get up on Christmas morning, you'd have a few gifts, but there'd always be an or- a couple of oranges in, in the Christmas stocking as well. You know? Imagine yeah. doing that to kids today, they're going, an orange? <laughs> orange. <laughs> yeah. my, my, my parents, they, they, they used to put um, an orange in there. I don't know whether it's... Uh, which actually did, I think they did sometimes. They didn't always, but they did sometimes, yeah. just a bit of a traditional thing. I remember, I remember yeah. a few times getting an orange. My okay. parents did yeah. the same, yeah. Even though I hated oranges, but it was <laughs> I, I, I had siblings, so we all got the exact same you know thing in our, in our stockings. So. Yeah, yeah. Good chocolates oh, and oranges and little little toys, like but small toys, you know. Uh, yeah. Pack a pack a pack of trump cards. Donald. Top, <laughs> yes. top, top trumps. Yeah. 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 They didn't. Know. Oh, oh. Sorry. <laughs> Just the name. For anyone oh, who's uh, cards, yeah. listening to this podcast or watching this podcast on YouTube, um, at the time of recording, Donald Trump is still the next president of the United States, um, but may not be by the time that this podcast goes up and you're listening to it. We'll find yes, out. we will see. I mean, we will see in the upcoming days. I mean, yeah. in fairness, the next few few podcasts we record, he'll still be president until until January. That's true, actually. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Yeah. 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 Unless, thinking, he, yeah. unless he flees the country um, <laughs> whilst <laughs> president. Is. Yeah, <laughs> there's always a possibility. There's always a possibility. I guess one thing we haven't done yet, Richard. Um, I'm sorry, is um, we haven't explicitly mentioned your website or anything that you'd like. Yes, to about. Um, we'll put a description. We'll put the links in the description on YouTube. But obviously, yep. this podcast has an audio only version on Spotify and things like that. So if you want to um, mention your 
whichever I, websites or whichever books you'd like to promote? I would be delighted uh, to. Well, my website is ripperteur.com. So ripperteur.com, and that will take you through to the full Jack the Ripperteur website. And that's where you can find all my blogs, etc. But I've actually uh, got an, uh, an, an, a new website, <laughs> which uh, I, I've, I've, I've recently launched a publishing company. And uh, we're, doing, we're doing books on, uh, on London. And our first uh, book is Jack the Ripper's East End. And it's a three and a half hour self-guided tour around the East End of London. And it visits all 11 Whitechapel murder sites and does all the buildings that still survived uh, and goes through the area. And that, that is edgarsguides.com. So it's E-D-G-A-R-S, edgarsguides, or one word, edgarsguides.com. Fantastic. And that sounds wonderful. Yeah. yeah. It, was an, it was an absolute joy writing that book because uh, I, I, I discovered places, because I was working, walking everywhere, I discovered places that, I, despite the fact that I've been doing the tour since 1982, I'm ashamed to say I found places during lockdown when I was doing this book that I just did not know existed. I, I, I found a oh, fantastic, fantastic. Not, uh, just, just off uh, Hanbury Street where Annie Chapman was murdered. Hanbury Street actually continues and it goes all the way down towards um, uh, Valance Road. But halfway down Hanbury Street, as you're going towards Valance Road, you pass a, over Spellman Street and then there's a left turn. If you take that left turn, suddenly you encounter this, these cottages from the 1850s Victoria cottages, Albert cottages, oh, wow. and they were built for the work, the poor working people of Whitechapel. And if you if you go around to the side of them, there's a gate that goes behind, uh, and a path runs through all the cottages, and they've got the most exquisite gardens, and they're all listed now. But they were built for, as two stories, so one family would live on the ground floor, one f- uh, family would live on the first floor. They're now complete complete cottages, but they're genuine survivors. You just would not know they were. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Oh, that was the Victorian East End, and, uh, yeah. and I, 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 I passed that street many times. And the only thing <laughs> was, I was just curious because I was doing that. I thought, "What is down here?" And I went down, and I, 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 I could not contain my my excitement when I when I discovered these cottages. I, I filmed them, I put them on the website. Oh, amazing! And I, I would urge everyone to go to go and uh, not even even if you don't buy the book, just go and look at those cottages. I've just off spell off Hanbury Street. <laughs> Fantastic. And um, yeah, am, I, am I right in thinking that you do some, um, some virtual tours as well during lockdown, haven't you? Yes, on, on the ripperteur.com website, uh, you'll find the link to my virtual tours. And I, uh, I, 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 I really ham it up for them. I, I put on the full Victorian outfit. Fantastic. <laughs> and I, and I, I do an hour and 15 minutes just going through the whole Jack the Ripper story from uh, the, Emma Smith right the way through to uh, well, Mary Kelly. And then just to, uh, through to uh, ask, and then people can ask as many questions at the end. I stay behind, and we do a Q and A session at the end. So, and then people can do a quiz afterwards as well. So. Oh, amazing! <laughs> All right, sounds good. First question: Who is Jack the Ripper? <laughs> Never heard of him. <laughs> so, should we move on to the main topic of this week's discussion? And mm. uh, in particular, Richard, we're we're looking at at Mary Kelly, the um the fifth uh, fifth uh, victim in, of the canonized victim, right? Um, can you give a little canonical, bit of background? Canonical, canonical sorry, canonical <laughs> victim. Saint, Saint um, Mary Kelly. Saint Mary Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> that's not that's not quite right. Um, you can find her on Vauxhall Bridge in Saint, <laughs> in, Saint in Saint Paul's. <laughs> yeah, yeah, tiny miniature. Uh, can you give a bit of background to it? Um, and well, I guess the Jack the Ripper victims in general, and um, and just just talk us through a little bit about Mary Kelly and who she was. Well, Mary Kelly was the last canonical victim of Jack the Ripper, uh, as you alluded to when you were introducing the subject. Uh, it's almost impossible to say how many victims Jack, victims Jack the Ripper had because we don't know who Jack the Ripper was, so we mm-hmm. can't say how many victims were definitely murdered by Jack the Ripper. Uh, the general consensus of the five victims: Mary Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride. Catherine Eddowes, and then Mary Kelly. So she's the last victim. She's murdered on the 9th of November, 1888. And she's the most in- enigmatic of all the victims because she's the one we know least about. We don't know where she came from. We don't know her history. We don't know how she came to be in the East End of London. Uh, we don't know any descendants or anything like that. So we know virtually nothing about her. And of course, when you know nothing about somebody, then that's when you can start going into the realm of myth. And so contrary, there's a lot of myths about Mary Kelly. And she's always the one in the films who's always portrayed by uh, the star uh, of the, or the female lead in the film. So oh, yeah. Heather Graham in the Johnny Depp film from Hell played her. 
And there's all sorts of theories about, about her that uh, she was murdered. And if you want a good conspiracy theory, there's a theory that the person murdered wasn't actually Mary Kelly, that it was actually somebody else was murdered in that room. And then Mary Kelly used the opportunity to disappear because she needed to disappear. So, uh, and then Johnny Depp. Yeah. And, and I think from hell has her running off with uh, Inspector Abilene at the end of it and, uh, and going off to live happily ever after or something like that. So, uh, yeah, yeah, raising the very, daughter yeah. of um, the other Annie Crook, is it? Is, uh... Yeah, yeah. yeah, the th- yeah. Uh, it, it all comes from the, the Stephen Knight book, uh, the, uh, uh, the Final Solution, which has got the, the it, it started off the whole royal conspiracy. Uh, and, and there's lots of different strands to the royal conspiracy theory. But the main strand that comes from Stephen Knight is Prince Albert Edward Victor, who's the Duke of Clarence, Queen Victoria's grandson, also the heir presumptive of the throne of England. So he should have been King of England. But he married a girl, a Catholic girl, and uh, they had a child. And the child, obviously, that posed a bit of a threat. So the Masons came in and they uh, put uh, his, his supposed wife, Annie Crook, into an asylum the child was then smuggled to safety by the servant girl, Mary Kelly, who brought the child to the East End of London. And then she put her into the keeping of the convent, which is now the Providence Row Night Shelter, or was the Providence Row Night Shelter. It's now the homes for the London School of Economic Students. And uh, then she moved into the street opposite, Dorset Street. And, she kept, and then she told several other uh, women in the area what she knew. Uh, and they set about blackmailing the royal family. So the Masons went out again. And one by one, they eliminated the threat. So in a nutshell, that's the royal conspiracy theory. Mm. And is, is, there, is there any kind of basis to it? Or is it, is it literally just a, a theory that's kind of been plucked out of thin air based on, uh, you know, the, the character of Albert? Or, or you know, is there, any, is there any truth to it? There is. Uh, there's uh, there's uh, absolutely none. No. It's one that gets... It's with my snail medieval thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's one that does get brought up and maybe gets more attention than it should then. Because it is, I mean, of course, the, if you were looking at um, f- uh, From Hell and, you know, being brought up in popular media, it's, it, of course, it makes quite a nice, uh, quite a nice film, I, I, I guess. Yeah. But, but I guess it does, yeah, it does seem to pop up or uh, crop up again and again, which is, yeah, maybe, maybe not... Not, not right, considering how far down the list of, um, of probables it is. So in terms, of, in terms of some of the other theories of who Jack was, which ones do you think are the most kind of viable? Can I just say about Prince Albert and Victor, which is quite topical, quite topical at the moment though. He died, uh, oddly enough, he died in the flu pandemic of 1889 to 18... Uh, he, actually, he actually died in, uh, I think it was 1891, 92 but he actually yes. died in, in the flu band- pandemic. And that was a, a pandemic that swept across Europe from uh, late 1889. Uh, and the, the newspapers of the day were constantly reporting that it's, 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 it's moved across, it's come from the Far East, it's, <laughs> it's now arrived in Europe, it's in, it's in Spain, it's in Italy, it's in France. And, and, then, and then it came into England in December 1889. Uh, and the strange thing about it was that it didn't seem to affect the young. <laughs> It, uh, oh, it, it, it affected the uh, uh, it affected the old, the older ones. So you've got records of entire post offices where all the postmen are down with it. You have schools where all the teachers have got it, but none of the pupils have got it. So mm, interesting. Uh, and he died. He died in that pandemic. So uh, and he's buried in. If you go to Windsor Castle, he's actually as you come out of St George's Chapel, Windsor. You, you pass his tomb where, where Prince Albert Edward Victor's buried. And contrary to what they say about him in, in all the films and all the theories say, he was very, very popular. Uh, with, with, uh, it was, he, he was like, uh, probably like, uh, like Prince William uh, today. Uh, and, but for his death in, uh, from the flu pandemic, he would have been King of England. Wow. Crazy. Oh, wow. Twist of fate, yeah. And because actually we, you mentioned this to me the other week, Richard, when we spoke about you, you appearing on this podcast, actually, you suggested a really fascinating idea about um, the frequency with which pandemics occur um, is, is very interesting. But that's probably a different topic for a different time. Different topic. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> but um, so, so, yeah, I mean, you brought up the fact that I, I was particularly interested to get your thoughts on Mary Kelly and, and pluck your brains, your knowledge. Um, because we often get caught up in the whole trying to solve the mystery of who was Jack the Ripper, and we don't really talk much about who the victims were. And it's not because we don't know anything about them. As you said, we know a fair amount, don't we, about the first four, at least. Um, But no one ever really talks about them in detail because everyone's more interested in who the killer was. Um, 
But with Mary Kelly, you say she's very enigmatic, but do we know where she came from? The, um, w w the only things we know about Mary Kelly is what she told people about herself. Uh, she said she came from Limerick in Ireland, so she, she, was, uh, she was Irish. She then moved to Wales. She married a Welsh coal miner. The coal miner was then killed in a, in a colliery accident. Uh, and then she then, uh, well, first of all, she came to London. Then she went to Paris to became, become a, a high-class uh, prostitute in Paris, came back to the West End of London, and then came to the East End of London. Uh, but we don't know how much of that's true or not. We, don't, we mm. just, uh, as I say, we, we, we know absolutely nothing about her uh, before right. she turns up in the East End <laughs> of London. And she's a classic paradox. It's, it's yeah. a, in fact, they all, they're all a paradox in that, in a way, they're, these are five women whose names we would have long ago forgotten if it hadn't been for the fact they were murdered by somebody whose name we'll probably never know for certain. Yeah, that's a really yeah. good point. Yeah. 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 I mean, is it common? She seems like she's very well traveled for someone, what was she, 25 when she died? And she's a when woman. She died. She's a woman in, 18, in the 1880s, but she's traveled from Ireland to Wales to London to Paris and back to London. Is that common? Uh, C certainly, the, I mean, there the was movement uh, it, uh, for courtes courtesans. If you, if you talk about high class courtesans, they oh, would yeah. move around. They'd move around Europe. They, I mean, Paris was was you know like a centre for it. London, the West End of London, of course. You had the West, West End of London. Uh, there was a lot lot going on in England in regards. I mean, there's, there's now a train of thought that uh, that they weren't that it, it that the victims weren't prostitutes. Uh, that, that, that basically that they they that, that uh, misogyny has led to them being dubbed prostitutes. So the police dubbed them prostitutes. The press mm. dubbed them prostitutes. Authors and historians have since dubbed them prostitutes. Yeah. Uh, the theory is that they were they uh, and in several cases that they were sleeping. Uh, they were sleeping. So Mary Nichols was sleeping in the gateway in Bucks Row when right. her killer chanced upon her. Mary Kelly's the difficult one for that theory because Mary Kelly herself stated that she'd been a prostitute. So you, there, <laughs> there is no way around that. Uh, yeah. uh, personally, I, I've, I've never liked the word prostitute to describe them anyway, mm -hmm. because um, they were all alcoholics. They'd all slipped through the net. There was no social security. There was nothing to catch you. And uh, it's a bit like being self-employed today in, <laughs> in, the, in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but they'd all gone through the net. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was absolutely nothing to stop them falling. So the, that they fell through. Alcoholism led to their downfall and led them to be whether they were sleeping or whether they're out on the street. So I've never liked the word prostitute to describe them anyway. I've always thought the Victorian word for them, unfortunates, is a much better description. Mm. Right, because prostitute is. would imply it's a choice. Yeah. Like, they, like a career move that they've made. Yeah, you get um, the idea they were working girls. Yeah. You know? And uh, yeah. yeah, maybe they did to survive to get, I mean, we know Mary Nichols, for example. We certainly know that she went out to earn fourpence for a bed for the night. And uh, she was going out in the early hours of the morning. So the, if you know it's uh and she she boasted that a friend of hers called ellen holland met her at the end of osborne street an hour and a half or just uh, just over an hour before her body was discovered and she boasted she'd made the dos money three times over but every time she'd made it she'd spent it on drink and she was now oh. going to try and make it one last time if you think about it there's not many ways at that time in the morning that she could have been <laughs> intending to make the money so it's uh, it's mm, all yes. there in the witness statements it's if you yeah. choose to believe the witness statements or not yeah that's that's the thing is it with I mean, I think even today, well, maybe not so much in the 21st century, but certainly in the, maybe in the 70s and 80s and before policing in, in the UK, they would, you'd often target a particular group or uh, as, as being, you know, a prostitute or, 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 you know, ruffian or something, because then it, it, if, you know, people think, oh, it doesn't really matter, does it? I mean, a prostitute's died for a lot of people they would they would see that as not being such a big deal especially in the 1880s um they'd be of course they'd be more fascinated with the the, the you know the method of killing and, and and the fact that this is you know a potential serial killer but in terms of the victims they, they can largely be forgotten and swept under the carpet if they are labeled as such um so yeah i think that's that's quite interesting and something that's maybe on purpose that they were called that as a, as a means of kind of deflecting attention away from the authorities who are meant to be, you know, trying to capture this, this, this person. Mm. Very much. And there's also, uh, there was a, a huge battle going on at the time as well, that um, they passed uh, the Criminal Law Amendment Act uh, in 1885. That, and in fact, the repercussions of that are still with us in several ways. 
Uh, that was the Act of Parliament that raised the age of consent to 16. Uh, it was also the, the Act of Parliament that made homosexuality a criminal offence. And, oh, wow. okay. and that was enforced till the 1960s, of course. Mm. And, uh, but, uh, and it also uh, ta tackled the problem of the brothels as well. And uh, local vigilance committees were formed to close down the brothels. And this was happening a lot in the East End of London. There's a chap called Frederick Charrington, who was the heir to the Charrington Brewing Fortune. And he was leading a one-man crusade to close all the brothels in the East End of London and doing it very successfully as well. Uh, the problem was he was one of the reasons that so many people, so many women were out on the streets because uh, no matter how bad the brothels were, they offered them some form of protection. Uh, but because Charrington was closing down the brothels, then the women ended up on the streets. There'd mm. also been a very famous case in 1887 when PC Endicott had arrested a lady called Mrs. Uh, Miss Maria Cass. And he'd arrested her at 10 o'clock on Jubilee night in June 1887. And he'd arrested her for being a prostitute because she was out on her own on Regent Street at 10 o'clock at night. And she ended up in court the next day and the magistrate threw the case out. But he did say to her, he said, um, but if you are a respectable lady, as you say you are, then uh, just take note. No respectable lady goes out at 10 o'clock at night on, uh, on Regent Street unless she is out for immoral purposes. She said oh, she wow. had a pair of gloves. <laughs> and, uh, but the funny thing was, or the interesting thing was, that her case got picked up by her employer, who then took it to uh, several members of parliament, uh, liberal members of parliament. And those members of parliament then led a, a, a press campaign uh, that the police should not label a woman a prostitute just because she went out on her own at night. And, oh, that's, that's good. I was, <laughs> yeah. I was expecting it to be the other, yeah. I was expecting it to be the other way around that they would, that they, you know, they, they would have got rid of her. That's good that they backed her on it. On it. Yeah, she was backed by several liberal, liberal members of parliament. Yes. And Sir Charles Warren, the Metropolitan Police Commissioner, held, a, um, uh, held an inquiry into it. Uh, and he headed it up himself, which was the press then said, well, you know, he's the Metropolitan Police Commissioner. How can he be in charge of investigating himself? But he found that Endicott had done nothing wrong. But the Liberals then pushed for it, and uh, Endicott ended up in court charged with perjury. In, uh, in, in, uh, never, but that meant that prostitution that the year before had been very much in the newspapers. And so constantly the police had got their knuckles wrapped over it. And they were right. very reluctant then to address, uh, arrest prostitutes in 1888. So mm. they turned a blind eye to it, which again played into the hands of Jack the Ripper. Oh gosh, wow. that's, that's fascinating. Yeah. Because that's, um, that's the, the great thing about history. Uh, and, and that's a wonderful example of it, Richard. Thank you so much. Um, is the complex uh, cultural and social situations that we can't appreciate uh, living in whatever age we're living in, looking back in the past. And we always see things through the filter of the way we understand now, don't we? Um, so that, as you say, that influences the way that history is recorded and reported what, what they termed a prostitute back then um, wasn't necessarily what we would think of today as a prostitute. I mean, I'm sure by and large it is. Um, but as you say, these women weren't, weren't necessarily what we'd think of as a prostitute today. They weren't professionals um making a living with high class clients they were just alcoholic women trying to make a penny to spend what was it the a dos house is that what they called it um, dos house, well, common common lodging house where they yeah pay, uh, they for the night for a bed huh? yeah and they pay it nightly um so they need to make money somehow uh, every yeah. night yeah. Yes. and this certainly That's happened after the murder of annie chapman you get the newspapers start to take note and there's very famous i think it was the telegraph did an article where they said dark that her name was, <clears> her nickname was dark annie uh, and the Telegraph article was that dark Annie's spirit will not walk in vain if we can just, uh, if, if it makes us realize that these women are going, uh, and it was quite a dramatic article, but it spoke about how for the mm. sake of fourpence for a bed, she'd gone out onto the streets and been forced to embrace her murderer, and, uh, mm. which, which was quite mm. dramatic. So contrary to what people think when they look back, there was a lot of sympathy, uh, certainly after Annie Chapman's murders, towards the plight of the victims. And that sort of changed probably after the night of the double murder when the name Jack the Ripper was given to the killer. And from that point on, it became almost a street pantomime. We know that people are out selling ballads about Jack the Ripper on the streets of the East End uh, and, were, wow. and crowds were around the murder sites and people were selling all sorts of things to them. Wax works were opening up in the, in the area uh, where they had these wax effigies of the victims. Uh, and so it then became sort of almost a, a street theater and a pantomime. Wow, See, I never like, imagined that that would happen so quickly, like while the events were still unfolding. I thought the like legend of Jack the Ripper would be something that built over time, but 
uh, yeah, wow. The fact that that was, <laughs> like you say, the, the sympathies were with the victims and then halfway through it, kind of like when the name was coined, that's when, you know, people were, uh, yeah, it all became all about Jack. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Interesting. I mean, it's still, I think that's still reflected today, isn't it? You only have to look at the cases of, I don't know, Madeleine McCann, even though she hasn't been confirmed dead, but there's that, that pantomime around it, isn't there? There's, I mean, it, part of it's the 24 new, uh, hour news cycle, but it doesn't seem to me like much has changed in terms of everyone's on, you know, on the ground level wanting to get as much information as soon as they can about what's happened, who the victims are, who the killer is. And it's, it, it's, there's that excitement around it, isn't there, that still exists today. And there was evidently there in Whitechapel in 1888, yeah. Mm. Well, it seems even pe- 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 people respond to fear and the newspapers know that terrifying people uh, can, can sell newspapers. And you can see it going on with the, uh, the COVID pandemic at the moment. <laughs> At the moment, I mean, when you think about the, the news, you know what, what the, new, the way the news media are hand, handling, we get, we're getting bombarded with sort of um, uh, the stories about it. And, uh, and the same with Jack the Ripper. When, when you look at what the newspapers did, they absolutely terrified people uh, mm. simply because they knew that if you terrify people, they want to read more about it. Our flight and uh, flight and uh, our flight and fight comes into play, mm. and we just need to know where where the danger is. And, if that uh, wasn't. Um, the Jack the Ripper name comes from a letter, wasn't it? That was sent into the newspapers. But don't they think that letter was written by a journalist? Is that right? Yeah, uh, it yeah. was probably a journalist. I mean, Jack the Ripper per se that never existed. There was, there was never a killer called Jack the Ripper, uh, and that that that's the problem we have today. Is that uh, yeah. I, I always do a test when I do uh, t- uh, take school groups around, and I always I always say to them, you know, if, if we knew who wrote the letter, would we know who Jack the Ripper was? And uh, I get people saying, well, no, well, well certainly, uh, no, no, because uh, whoever, whoever wrote the letter wasn't Jack the Ripper. <laughs> and I point out, no, whoever wrote the letter was Jack the Ripper, because that's how they signed the letter. But whoever wrote the letter was, wasn't the Whitechapel murderer. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's the problem. We have to separate the Whitechapel murderer from Jack the Ripper. Yes. Yeah. Yes, interesting. That's a challenge. Yes. You I find it... the... Oh, sorry, oh, sorry Alex, go ahead. I was just going to say, I find it so sad that not much is known about Mary Kelly. And um, I'm just reading that they couldn't find any family members to attend her funeral. Uh, I wonder how common that was like around this time. Is it quite unusual that we, we can't really know nothing about or very little about about her? Or do you think that was pretty common oh, was, with murders around this time? It was incredibly common for that to happen. Um, the first Whitechapel murder victim was Emma Elizabeth Smith, uh, murdered on Easter Tuesday, 1888. And she, uh, when she, she, when she was in the hospital, she, she was attacked by a gang. And she was, it was a very brutal assault that she suffered. But she survived it and she staggered back to the lodging house. And the lodging house, uh, or deputy lodging house keeper Mary Russell, was quite alarmed at the pain she was in and the distress. And she persuaded to go to the London hospital with her. And there she told Dr. Haslip, she was talking to the doctor, Dr. Haslip, uh, and she said that uh, she hadn't seen her family for over 10 years. Uh, and she mm-hmm. had been asked, you know, what, why, why won't you see your family? And she said, they wouldn't understand now, just like they didn't understand then. And that's mm-hmm. probably the story of them all. And she was, she was an alcoholic as well. And it's, uh, it's, it's just, a, you know, just a litany of tragedy, really, that for these women and the lives. Of the, and it, in some ways, I think it does them a disservice because that, to, to try and, if you like, canonize them as such, uh, to say, oh, they weren't prostitutes, they were just women who were trying to survive. Because basically, uh, it, it was society's failing. And uh, if we ignore those lessons, then we could easily, sl- oh, in fact, we are, <laughs> we are ignoring those lessons, and we can easily slip back into it. We never learn from history. Oh, I wish we would. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, um, he, Going back, to, actually, this is great. I'm glad you mentioned that, Alex, and thank you, Richard, because you mentioned the wax effigies that they made of the victims. To... Do we know what Mary Kelly looked like? Because of all the victims, she was the one who was most brutally carved up by the killer. And I think he took her face off, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. We, don't, we, we honestly don't know uh, for certain what she looked like. There's press depictions of her. Uh, but like you say, she, I mean, she'd been skinned down to the bone and, uh, it's, uh, I mean, I think it was, a her, her lover who she'd separated from just a few weeks before, mm-hmm. 
<laughs> I've just totally forgotten his name. Uh, Joseph Barnett. <laughs> uh, Joseph Barnett. He could only identify her by her eyes and ears. Uh, and that's, uh, so that's just how brutal that murder was. Mm. And, uh, so we don't I'm not know. sure I could identify my wife by her ears, to be honest. Yeah. He is, if she's yeah. listening to this she'll be disappointed but I mean, if, you, if you gave me an ear I'm like, he is alone yeah could be yeah could be anybody's uh, <laughs> um, also just just mentally i don't think i could identify anyone like in that state um no yeah you're yeah. not exactly thinking straight are you uh, no. yeah Ooh. that's terrible because um because there's new paper drawings or sketches. Um, I know this because when we were making our documentary, uh, our program together um, uh, last year, uh, we, we made drawings of each of the victims to bring up some graphics on screen. And the thing that struck me is that we based those drawings upon the newspaper sketches. And I thought that actually most of the newspaper sketches of the victims, they all looked quite similar as if maybe the same artist had drawn the sketches and just used the same kind of template for this is what a woman looks like and, you know, change the hair, change the dress, but that was pretty much it. Um, and the one of Mary Kelly uh, is, I thought, kind of fairly indistinct compared to the others because there are photographs, police photographs of the bodies. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, for some of the victims at least. So we can actually compare them to the drawings and be like, okay, that you can see where they've taken the features from. But with Mary Kelly, something about the drawing that does exist of her that was printed in the newspaper is fairly anonymous almost. Yeah. I mean, um, the thing about the news, that newspaper was the, 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 one you, the newspaper you're referring to is the Illustrated Police News. Hmm. Uh, and basically they would just have had uh, artists on, on, uh, there. Uh, probably the artist never went anywhere near the scene. It was the journalists who came back and they, they, they'd interviewed them and said, what did she look like? And so it'd be like a, uh, like a, a police draw, a police sketch today, you know, when they're trying to identify someone. Yeah, a photo fit is that? Yeah. And so they come back. Yeah. And the artist would just draw yeah. it up, but they they probably had a, they they had a template. I mean, it, yeah. to, to the readers, I mean, it didn't really matter. It just gave them an idea that that it was that was female, and so they just have this standard idea of them. Uh, but those photographs are interesting because they're quite haunting, uh, the mm -hmm. photographs of the victims. But the reason they were done was because, of course, the police simply had an unidentified female in the mortuary. So they had to identify her. So they would call in a photographer, have the body photographed, and then they would reproduce the photographs and hand them out to detectives and police officers or police constables. And they'd simply take them around the district saying, do you recognize this woman? Do you know who this woman is? Uh, and they'd hope that somebody would then recognize, so they could identify the woman. That's wow. how the majority of the victims were identified. Right. So that it was lucky that, sorry. It was fortunate for the police investigation that Mary Kelly was killed in her home, because how would they, if he'd done that to her on the street, how would they ever have identified who she was? Now, I mean, the only way it probably would have happened is that someone had said, yeah, I've not seen her for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were saying it might, might, it might well be Mary Kelly. But uh, yeah, I mean, Mary Kelly was, and that's the intro, that, that's why, another reason why Mary Kelly is so <laughs> enigmatic as well, because she was the one murdered indoors. All the others were murdered on the streets. She was murdered indoors. She had her own room. And, yeah. uh, and, when you think, I, I, and it was literally, it was just a, a, a very small, very tiny room, but it was her own room. Although she was 29 shillings in rent arrears on the night she was murdered. And that's yeah. probably why she went out because she knew, a landlord was going to come and collect, or was going to come around to collect the rent the next day. She hoped to make 25 shillings in one night. Uh, <laughs> or maybe have something to pay towards it. <laughs> yeah. Because she was sharing the room with um, her partner, Joseph Barnett, right? So till, that's how till, she was till, able to afford it before. Is that right? Yeah, till shortly yeah. before the, her murder. And then yeah. he, he'd been made, he became unemployed and she'd gone back on, uh, into prostitution. Uh, and this led, that's why he left. He just said he, could, he couldn't live with her while, while she was doing that. So he, he, went, he moved out. And, uh, uh, and then Mary Kelly had s several women staying around uh, mm -hmm. uh, over, that, over that period. In fact, he saw her at eight o'clock on the night before she was murdered in the early hours of the next morning. He went around to see her. So they stayed on good terms and they stayed friends. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, he's now turned up on the list of suspects as well. Of course he has. That's so tragic. Yeah. Um, so sad. It's very, it's, very, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's very sad. I mean, they're, they're all sad stories. I mean, when, when, when you, I mean, one thing that you do that comes across from the victims is that, uh, the, I mean, for example, if you take Elizabeth Stride, uh, I mean, she, she, again, she, she told stories. She 
was could tell stories about herself. One thing she claimed was that her, 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 her husband and children had been killed in the Princess Alice disaster uh, when the, the 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 cruiser or the the the, uh, the, the paddle steam of the Princess Alice had been coming back from uh, Gravesend, and it had been hit by a, a huge a collier or collier ship called the Byworth Castle and it had sunk just off um, uh, well just at the mouth of the river uh, the river Roding when it goes into the River Thames and the ship had sunk there just at the moment when they'd opened the main sewer and let all the sewage into the river and some over 600 men women and children were drowned in that in that disaster and Ooh. she claimed that her uh, that her family were amongst them one of the newspapers at the time did say but they'd gone through the records and yeah, her, 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 certainly sure enough, her family weren't there, but right. there's no, there's no record. If you go back through the records, there's a memorial to the victims in uh, Woolwich cemetery. If you go to Woolwich cemetery, there's a memorial to the princess Alice victims. And uh, there's in fact, funnily enough in the, in the cemetery that Elizabeth strides buried in East London cemetery, there's also a, a memorial as you go up the path to turn towards her grave. There's a memorial on the right, to an entire family that were drowned in that disaster. They went out for a day uh, just to enjoy a day down on the coast and they were killed coming back. And it was, uh, it was I mean, the, the, it was a trap. So, uh, but there's no evidence that, that any of her family were ever on it. And uh, and she was certainly able to play fast and fast and loose with the truth whenever it suited. So it was, mm. uh, it was, yeah. But uh, let's say it was all tragic, all tra- tragic lives. And of course, she, she was quite mysterious because she was Swedish as well. So she was, Elizabeth Stride was a Swedish lady. Um, yeah. uh, but was Stride her married name? Or did she just change it? Stride was a married name, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, 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 she'd married, and her husband died of natural causes in the, in the early 1880s. Hmm. And then, of course, being a widow, she then couldn't afford to survive. So she, that's when she ended up in the common lodging houses. Uh, but they, I mean, she did things on, on the afternoon of a murder. She'd been cleaning uh, in the lodging house and she'd earned a bit of money from that mm. and then gone out on the town for the night. And there's several sightings of her uh, that night. She goes to the Queen's Head at, uh, at just after 6.30. Then she's uh, seen in the doorway of the Bricklayer's Arms on, uh, I've just forgotten the name of the street, but uh, but she's, she's uh, it's just off Commercial Road, oddly enough. And uh, she's seen in that doorway with a man and two, the two men who saw her, they, they actually taunted them saying, watch out, that's Leather Apron trying to get around you, which was, of course, an early name for the murder of Leather Apron. Mm. Uh, and the couple were very embarrassed by that. And they hurried off into the, into the night, heading towards Commercial Road. And uh, now whether that was a man who murdered her, we, we don't know. But uh, as I say, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a tragic story. But she went out for a night. And, and sure. uh, yeah, you said that she was, um, worked as a, a domestic servant or did some, some that kind of work. Was that, that was the same for, um, for Mary Kelly as well, right? Did she spend some time working other job, uh, just, you know, regular jobs as well? Was she a domestic servant in a household? Is that right? And, no, um, she, she, took she, in, she did take in laundry. Uh, okay. She, uh, the, the one who did, uh, uh, who did uh, other, I mean, Mary Nichols did, 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 was a domestic servant, hmm. but she was sacked for stealing from her employer. Oh, I see. Uh, she, no, she wasn't sad. Well, she was sad, but she actually ran off with a lot of money from the, uh, was, well, I think it was about 25 shillings from the employer. Annie Chapman used to sell, uh, sell all sorts of things around the streets, crochet, mm. etc., trying to make ends meet. Uh, and Catherine I mean, the... went hot, hot picking. And I don't yeah, know I mean, that's the... London when she was murdered. That's the thing. All these people have other jobs, and I mean, you you can look at it today, especially with with people that are struggling to to you know to make ends ends meet, and it's you know it, it's, there's it's not that much of a stretch from mm. having something that doesn't pay quite enough to having to do things that you don't want to do. Um, and just, you know, being a, a very ordinary person, just falling on hard times and being in this, you know, being known throughout history as, you know, as a, a prostitute when actually the stories are so, so tragic, you know, and mm-hmm. as you say, in, in most of the cases, all these people have had jobs before, very respectable, maybe not the highest paying jobs, but respectable jobs, ordinary jobs. And, um, and, and they just, as you say, they just slip through the net. And I think that's the kind of the overall picture I'm getting here is that these were people that have yeah, just they're literally they've fallen on hard times and you know, it's not that not, mm. uh, there's no fault to be to you know to be um, attributed um but unfortunately throughout history they've been deemed you know prostitutes and women of the night when actually that's such a small part of their their world and very characters yeah, yeah that's, the, that's the thing yeah you're so you're so right like it does it makes it sound like they're partially or like at fault in somehow when it's mm. it's society that has, has let them down 
Um, and yeah, you have first-hand experience of that, haven't you, Alex? You were a woman of the night for a while, is that true? Well, well, I am. I am hanging around Whitechapel area. Um, fingers oh. crossed, I'll catch him. I'll catch him in the act. Um, on Saturdays. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I was making a serious point. I'm really Robin. sorry. I interrupted that. With a, a really... <laughs> no, that's fine. Society's bad. History's repeating itself. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it's a lesson, and you know, it, it, anyone's circumstances can suddenly change. And of course, when you start that down, down, downward spiral, and alcohol uh, kicks in, or alcoholism, or a, any addiction then of course, then, then, then the battle for survival really begins because not only are you trying to survive, you're trying to feed an addiction as well. And it takes, it takes over. It becomes the obsession. What was the, uh, sorry. Like I said, what was the weapon of choice uh, for alcohol? Because in the turn of the century, around 1800, gin was the sin of the working classes, wasn't it? Uh, by 1888, was it still gin? Was that the... the yeah, gin, gin was still there, but uh, and anything really. The, the, the yeah. Alcohol uh, alcohol was relatively cheap, uh, and it was a means. I mean, the point is it, they used alcohol to forget. Uh, it was basically a way out uh, so that they wouldn't, you know, they could forget the, the waking nightmare. And, 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 of course, the other things we forget is that they would have been out on the streets at all hours. For example, we know that they had apron. I mean, Kath Meadows had an apron, and in the pockets of her apron were was everything she owned because they led a transient lifestyle in common lodging houses and everything you owned, you put into the big apron with a big pocket. In the front. If you look at any of the photographs, say of Dorset Street, you'll see the women all have these long white aprons on. Uh, mm. And most of them would have had everything in, in those pockets at the front of the apron. Wow. Mm. Oh, wow. That's <laughs> depressing. Mm. Um, was, um, mm. I was, oh, I was going to ask something, but I've forgotten what it was. Sorry, <laughs> one, you said something partway through that. Yeah, I can't remember that. Um, <laughs> so, so one of the things that interests me about this, uh, that like after the killing of Mary Kelly, that was like the last one, and we don't know what happened to him after that. And that's qu- quite unusual, right, with, with serial killers. Like something has to happen to them. They don't just kind of stop, stop yeah. killing. So, yeah. I mean... What what do we think happened like after after this? Were there well, any yeah, any strong that ideas? Was the last one. <laughs> uh, then something happened to him because don't forget there were there were several more Whitechapel murders. Rose Milet was murdered in December eighteen eighty eight. Alice Mackenzie in July eighteen eighty nine. The Pynchon Street torso was found under the railway arch in uh, September eighteen eighty nine. And then the last Whitechapel murder victim or murders victim was Francis Cole, who was murdered. Uh, Francis Cole, who was murdered on Friday the 13th of February, 1891. Uh, So the, if Mary Kelly was the last one, then something happened. And it's either, it's one of only a handful of things. Either he died. uh, It could have been by his own hand. It could have been uh, maybe he might've been murdered himself as well. It was a very very violent area. Uh, Or he could have just died of natural causes. Another possibility is he lived with a family and they put him into an asylum and, uh, Either they did it on purpose because they knew what he, what he was and who he was, or they didn't. They just thought he was acting oddly, so they put him into an asylum. Or the mm-hmm. authorities put him into an asylum. And uh, another possibility is he, he went somewhere else and he continued killing, and they never made the connection uh, that, that it was the same killing, which is very unlikely because the murders were reported everywhere in the world. And right. uh, we have murders going right through the 1890s into the 20th century. We have murders in New York, France, Portugal, Spain, Dominica, uh, and there's similar murders, and everyone, whenever that happens, it's always looked into, has Jack the Ripper come here? Is this Jack the Ripper? So yeah. that's oh, right. yeah. there uh, was um, There's that conspiracy theory that we, we spoke about on the channel years and years ago, that it, it could have been H.H. H. Holmes was one of the theories. Yeah. Um, the American serial killer who built... The Hotel that, of Death, was it? The Hotel yeah. of Death. Yeah. And then to, to, to distract people... He came to London for uh, for a couple of years and did some killings and makes and, perfect and sense. Went back. Me. Yep. <laughs> but funnily enough, on 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 election night, uh, was it 20, uh, when Don, Donald Trump got elected first time? Mm. Uh, I was actually doing a television program for the Discovery Channel in London uh, with Jeff Jeff Mudgett, who's uh, his great great I think his great 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 grandson, 
Uh, right, he's convinced right, right. And, and he and it was all about where was H.H. H. Holmes Jack the Ripper. And that was very topical that you bring that up now because that, <laughs> that was doing that last time Donald Trump was uh, <laughs> it's elected. Wow. Providential, I guess. That's it. <laughs> Trump and Jack the Ripper. Mm. Action? Mm, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, so going back to what you're saying about um, what happened to the killer, did he stop with Mary Kelly? What always fascinates me, and I'm sure is what fascinates everybody about Mary Kelly's death, is the severity of it, the cruelty of what he did to her. And the fact that after that point, as a lay person looking at the popular history, not the detailed history, but like the police files and things, there are no other killings that bear all the classic Jack the Ripper hallmarks are there after Mary Kelly. There are other possible victims but none of them have all the mutilations uh, that are characteristic of the killing of canonical five victims so do you think that it's possible that jack the ripper was in search of a victim to whom he could do what he did to mary kelly where he literally eviscerated her but circumstance meant that he was unable to do that to the first four victims but he did do it to the fifth victim and satisfied some kind of lust or curiosity and then just kind of quietly retired? Is that a possibility that you entertain? Or I, I don't think he would have retired. He, he would have carried on. I mean, the point about Mary Ke- or the difference between Mary Kelly and the, the previous murders was that um, they were murdered on the streets. So he mm. had limited time because any minute a, a police officer would come around on his beat. So he only had limited time. The difference with Mary Kelly was she had her own room. And she, uh, so therefore he had total privacy and he had uh, as long as he wanted with Mary Kelly. So that, I think that's the problem. Uh, and this, I should say the point about the canonical five is that's the uh, idea of uh, the chief constable of Scotland Yard, Melvin McNaughton, who went into office after the murders. But in 1894, he published or, or wrote what was called the McNaughton memorandum. And he actually said that, that, uh, well, he, he did it because a man named Thomas Cutbush had been accused by the Sun newspaper of be, having been the murderer. And uh, he, for some reason, we don't know why he did it, but for some reason, McNaughton uh, decided to prepare a memorandum. Possibly if questions are going to be asked in Parliament, but for some reason, he, and it, he was the one who states in this memorandum, the Whitechapel murderer had five victims and five victims only. And then he goes on to name the five victims. Now, the reason he does this is because he also, in that memorandum, talks of three men who were more likely than Cutbush to have been uh, the killer. Uh, one of them is Michael Osdrog, or Osdrog. Another one is Kosminski. But the other one was M.J. Druitt, uh, and, which is Montague John Druitt. Now, Montague John Druitt, he said he had from private information that had been given to him, he was convinced that Montague John Druitt was, had been the killer. Now, he was emphatic that, about that, that he was the killer. And so therefore, if you think, now Montague John Druitt committed suicide at the end of November 1888. He jumped into the River Thames. His body washed up at Chiswick on the last day of the year. Uh, and the point about that is that McNaughton was convinced Druitt was Jack the, uh, was Jack the Ripper. And had it, had it been the case that... Uh, the other, any of the later victims were by, by the same hand, then, of course, that would, that would eliminate mm-hmm. the suspect. And so that's where we get the concept of the canonical five from. Now, McNaughton's wrong in many things he says about virtually everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, uh, he wrote his memoirs, I think, The Days of My Years. And in the memoirs, he talks about cases like the Mary, well, Ellen and Piercy, uh, Mary Piercy case. And he gets facts wrong in that one, as that one as there's a, there's a girl called Alice, uh, Alice Jeffs who was murdered in West Ham in 1890. And he talks about her being, I went to see. But again, he gets things wrong in that as well. So McNaughton oh. uh, was, uh, he, he can't be relied upon for accuracy, but he's the one who gives us the concept of the Canonical Five. Mm. So if you, were to, if you were to say how many victims you think there were from your personal point of view attributed to the, to the single killer, how many would you say there are? <laughs> That's a tricky one, that. Uh, it could be as few as three, maybe four. Could be as many as eight. Uh, Martha Tabram, for example, had certain hallmarks of Jack the Ripper. She'd been pepper-potted from the throat to the abdomen by stab wounds. Uh, now, she was murdered in August, August, well, August the 7th, 1888. Uh, 
and her injuries weren't consistent, which is why a lot of people say she wasn't a victim. But it's what, whoever did murder her certainly targeted her throat and lower abdomen, which is what Jack the Ripper would have done or did do with his victims. So it, highly likely that was a learning curve for him. Uh, he would have been covered in blood when he left the scene of that crime. So thereafter, he, he evolved his modus operandi, and that is asphyxiating the victims before he carried out the mutilations. So uh, as I say, it's, uh, it's almost impossible to say because uh, we can't really look at the... Uh, uh, we've got the photographs of the victims, but we can't really... You know, we, we can't go for forensics, we can't go for DNA, anything like that. Uh, so it could, as I say, it could be three or four, it could be eight, uh, eight, eight of the victims. And the other thing is that there was another... The, the body of women's bodies were being found all over London at the time as well. Someone dumped another torso uh, of a female into the uh, ruins of, uh, or sorry, the foundations of what was to become Scotland Yard uh, around about in that, uh, around about the time of was it September, October, 1888. Then you had the Pynchon Street one. So, and a lot of people in it say, well, that, you know, that, that wasn't the work of Jack the Ripper. They weren't the work of Jack the Ripper. And if they weren't, then that means there was a second serial killer. <laughs> at the same time so for two horrible serial killers to turn up at the same time in the same area uh is is really when you think about it is is quite horrible in itself yeah not a good time to be a woman no no it's, uh, no. it's uh... i mean when is a good time to be a woman to, to be fair what um who so you say as few as three i've never heard that before which three in your mind are definitely the work of the ones that are most killer. consistent are Mary Nichols, Annie Chapman, and Catherine Eridos. Uh, so I think they're, they're, they're the three I would say certainly. Elizabeth Stride, there's, there's debate as to whether or not she was a victim because uh, she was actually seen by a man named Israel Schwartz being attacked at 12.45, 15 minutes before her body was discovered. And Israel Schwartz saw a man walk up to her, spin around, uh, throw her to the ground, and then attack her. And he thought it was a domestic argument and didn't want to get involved. So he crossed over the road and, and uh, uh, to get away from it. Uh, but it's highly likely he saw the early stage. Now, as he crossed the road, there was a man standing opposite lighting his pipe. And the man attacking the woman then shouted across. At the, he thought it was at the man lighting his pipe, the word Lipsky, and, which was a derogatory term towards Jews in the East End of London at the time. And uh, Israel Schwartz then thought the man who was lighting his pipe followed him. So he ran as quickly as he could to get away and managed to lose the man near, near the railway arches, oddly enough, close to, close to Pynchon Street. So um, it's, uh, and it's almost certain he would have seen the face of, he saw the face of, or, or saw the attack or the early stages of the murder of, of Elizabeth Stride. Now her throat had been cut, but the rest of the body hadn't been touched. And uh, the police surmised that the killer had been interrupted uh, Louis Deemschutz, who was the steward of a club adjoining Burner Street, came in with his pony and cart at one o'clock and the pony shied and pulled left uh, and he then found the body. Uh, so the police believed he'd interrupted the killer. But other people think that it was just a domestic squabble that she did know the killer and Schwartz had actually seen the domestic squabble that led to a murder. And of course, the thing is that lots of people, virtually everybody carried knives in those days as well. Mm. So it was, uh, it was quite common for people to have pen knives and stuff like that pocket knives and uh, carried knives with them. So she might not have been a victim of Jack the Ripper. And of course, Mary Kelly, if you look at Mary Kelly's injuries, uh, it's a completely different modus operandi, the skinning down uh, the bone, cutting the face, uh, cutting the face off, etc. It's done pure, I mean, uh, the case with that, and in fact, all the cases, and this is one thing that horrified people, was it was, there was no motive. Robbery couldn't be a motive because the women were too poor to be robbed. It was apparent that they hadn't been raped or uh, uh, that uh, there'd been no intercourse. Uh, so consequently, whoever did it, did it purely for the satisfaction and the thrill of carrying out those mutilations. He, he is escalating. You can see it with Mary Nichols is cut open, uh, so she's disemboweled. Annie Chapman has a, uh, her womb uh, taken out, uh, so he does cut out and go off with the womb from Annie Chapman. She's cut open. Elizabeth Stride, as I said, she just had her throat cut. Catherine, as you see the escalation in that uh, he's cut her open, He's also targeted the face for the first time. He's cut deep V's into the cheeks, V's into the eyelids. He's cut off the nose. So he has started that targeting there. And he's also gone off with a uterus and left kidney as well, which then becomes the subject of the from hell letter when Mr. George Lusk got sent the, uh, the letter from hell and wrapped inside it was half a human kidney. 
And then, of course, you come to Mary Kelly, where it does escalate. And then the later killings, uh, apart, apart from probably the Pinchot Street torso, Pinchot Street torso, the later killings aren't as vicious. Uh, they, again, simply throats cut. So maybe Alice McKenzie had a throat cut, Francis Cole's throat cut. Uh, they are the same killer who killed Elizabeth Stride, just a throat cutting. Uh, but we don't know. As I say, it's, it's, we've got none of the police evidence has survived, so it's almost impossible to solve the case today. Well, there well, we go. My next book cancelled. I won't <laughs> solve that case. Then. Oh, thank you so much, Richard. You're you're a fa- you're 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 a maestro when it comes to this thing, and um, and we're so we're so happy to have you on here as well. It's been it's been incredible to um to hear from you and and, and you know get your incredible insight into into Jack the Ripper, of course, of the victims as well, which is something that's so so often forgot. So thank you so much. And um and with that, are you are you guys up for a quiz? Interested in testing your knowledge? Testing yeah. those brains? Absolutely, okay. yeah. Very much so. Sounds good. <laughs> I haven't got much knowledge. I haven't got a brain, but... <laughs> uh, I feel really dumb having listened to you speak. I think we can all safely say that that's not true, Richard. Okay, it's time for this week's quiz. And as you, as always, there's 10 questions... And if we're tied, it could be a three-way tie, I guess. But if we're tied, Ooh, then we'll go to the bonus question to find out who this week's winner is. So, can you show me your buzzers? Richard, I mean, you've got a quite unique buzzer um, this week, haven't you? I have. Um, what is your buzzer? Buzz. Traditional. Traditional. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Analog. It's good. <laughs> I'm high tech. I'm high tech. <laughs> <laughs> Cost me a fortune on Amazon that one did. <laughs> Authentic sounds. Uh, um, Alex, what have you gone for this week? Well, I've gone for a, a classic. Uh, so I'll explain this. I'll, I'll do this and then explain it to Richard. Um, okay. Ah, the French champagne has always been celebrated for its excellence. So that is one of my favourite videos, just so you know, Richard, of Orson Welles doing like a, an advert for champagne and he's completely drunk. Um, <laughs> that's my, my go-to buzzer for these quizzes. I'm going to look that one up. Oh, it's a, it's a classic. It's so good. It's so good. We'll send you the link. It's, it's worth every penny. And it usually wins Alex the quiz. So now I know. I'm very good at using this buzzer. Um, my Robin. buzzer is uh, another old favorite of mine, uh, which I think you'll recognize uh, if you're a fan of movies. That's the Wilhelm scream, isn't it? It's is the Wilhelm scream. Famous in a lot of movies, including Star Wars. Especially, I think it's Star Wars probably that made it famous, wasn't it? Um, yeah, I think probably. so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And Indiana Jones. Okay. Ones. I've just realised I'm going to have to keep a tally, a three-way tally here, aren't I? <laughs> Otherwise, I'm just going to find out. Well, completely true. forget what's going on. Okay. Question number one. The state of Ohio is seen as a bellwether state. You know, this is quite quite topical right now. Um, Often accurately predicting the result of the US election. But what was the last year that it got it wrong? The French champagne. Yes, Alex. Was it 1992? It wasn't 1992, no. Shot in the dark. Mm. (laughs) Richard, yeah. what, are you, what are you thinking? Was it 2016? No, 2016, it got it right. No. Hmm. Your, your thoughts, Robin? Well, I'm thinking it's not 2016 or 1992. That's, that's oh, those would be good guesses, yeah. That's currently what I'm thinking. Um, 1980? No, it wasn't 1980. Um... I think you can think of a clue I could give you. Or we could go closest wins. Let's do that. Have one more guess each, and the closest to it wins if you don't get it. Okay. That could be any, any though. That's I don't know. Presidential election. <laughs> how long has it been? <laughs> oh, the answer was how long has it been? No, 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 not how long has it been, but how long do you think it's been? And then you'll be able to decipher the answer. I'm, I'm not going to play this tactically and just go for another guess. Okay. Um, is it 2008? Not 2008. Oh, no. I'm going to guess uh, 120 years. You've got to so give a that? date. What, what year is that? Okay, oh, 120 years. 
So that's, no, that's, that's, eight, that's 1900, isn't it? Nice and easy. Yeah, whatever the election was close to. <laughs> yeah. Richard, gonna, what are you thinking? I'm going to say 30 years. 30 years. So that would be 1990. Well, the correct answer is 1960. And I'm not going to give any of you a point because you're all really <laughs> 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 I mean, 1960. It went for Nixon. It went for Nixon. And, um, and of course, Kennedy, Kennedy won. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was the last time it got it wrong. So fingers wow. crossed. <laughs> Can I Question? just I was going to say that. Oh, wait. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. So that's, that's interesting. Yeah. Does Does that mean if you're, so if you're the, <laughs> yeah, if that's what I'm saying. And Ohio doesn't vote for you, you get assassinated. Is that what happens? That's pretty much what happens. So good yeah. luck to Biden if, if, uh, if he manages to get him. Yeah. Uh, question number two. We will keep that at keep that nil, nil, nil. Uh, what was the tallest building in the world before the Burj Khalifa was built in 2010? Mm. Mm. What was the tallest building before it? Yes, Robin. I, f- I don't know the name and I realise I might end up giving this away. Is the, the one in Canada, the... The tower. That's not that's not an acceptable the guess. One in Canada. <laughs> like, I can tell you it's not in Canada. Okay, well. Um hmm. tallest hmm. building in the world. Tallest building in the world. Um ah, the French champagne. I imagine it's not this, but Empire State Building? No, it's not the Empire State Building. Mm-hmm. Uh, what were you thinking, Richard? <laughs> it was somewhere in the world, wasn't it? Somewhere in the world, PC. Yeah. World. <laughs> <laughs> was it in Malaysia? No, but good guess. Good guess, because it's in, it's in that neck of the woods. It was, it was in uh, Taiwan. It was Taipei 101, was the oh. uh, tallest building in the world. Before. I was very close then. Not too, not too far off, not too far off. And I have a point for being very close, or half a point. <laughs> Having the right continent. I mean, someone's got to well, start winning at some point. So there's three of us <laughs> playing this quiz and none of us have any points so far. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might, you, someone has to get this one right. Okay, so question oh. number three. Okay. If both were still alive today, who would be older? Oh. Charles Dickens or Charles Darwin? <laughs> oh, that's actually... Ah, the French champagne. Going for if you get classic... it wrong, this, this is going to be interesting because Going someone else my... will have to buzz in quick. <laughs> Going for my classic 50-50, was it Charles Darwin? It was Charles Darwin. Oh. He was born in 1809. I believe Dickens was... Uh, 1812. 1812. Yeah, 1812. So one point to Alex. Well done, Alex. Question number four. What is a group of giraffes called? Alex. Um, a herd? It's not a herd. It probably can be called a herd. But, is this a word we're going to be able to guess? Is this... Yeah, it's, it, it, you know, it might be a no or you don't, but um, I'll give a clue if, you, if right. we don't get it in the first round. All right. Buzz. Yes, Richard. Anything you want, they're too tall to hear you. <laughs> <laughs> That's almost what the point there is. <laughs> Robin, you got any thoughts? Uh, was, no. Okay. <laughs> okay. The, the clue is, it relates to the question, question number two about the tallest buildings. Bzz. Taiwan. Yes, Taiwan, a Taiwan of giraffes. No, not a Taiwan. Yes. A Taipei? Not Taipei. Tallest um, animal? What type? Well, I'll give a clue after Alex to have a go. Ah, the French. Yes, um, Alex. Is it a Khalifa of drafts? It, it's not a Khalifa of drafts. Okay, what type, what type of building would the tallest building in the world be? Oh, right. Okay. Yes, Robin. Skyscraper. Skyscraper of giraffes. Now, that would be cool. But it's not. Oh. Oh, oh okay. Got a thought. I think so, but I've had a guess. So. Hmm. What type of building would a tall building be? 
That isn't skyscraper. It isn't skyscraper. <laughs> oh my god! I don't know. I can't think of anything. You're you're really testing me on my my knowledge <laughs> of building is, types. Is this quiz too hard this week? <laughs> I think it might be actually. It's one of the hardest quiz we've ever done. Um, I mean, and I'm, I'm not going to have a go if, they, if that's allowed. I'll, I'll, I'll let you have another go if the other guys uh, have a pass on this one. If you, if you, if you, yeah, I'll pass. I'll pass. Okay. I, I, well, I for one will not pass. <laughs> sit here until I get up. Go, go for it, Robin. What are you thinking, Robin? A tower. A tower is correct. A tower of giraffes. Ooh. That's what a group of giraffes is called. So, well done, Robin. You get the point. A, tow- a tower to me is like tower. the Tower of London. It's not like a big skyscraper. It's more. Yeah, more well, like there's the, 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 the Sears the Tower in Chicago was once the tallest building in the world. Yeah, the ta- something the towering towers inferno. over you if it's tall. Two towers. Yeah, yeah. towering for Yeah. Two towers. Yeah. Yes, Two yeah, exactly. Okay. Two towers, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic <laughs> example that, yes. As, as re- you've shot my point down <laughs> on three fronts. It's a there, word so. that literally means <laughs> tall thing. You, know, it's a, you don't call anything a tower unless it's a big, tall thing. So, you know. The Tower of London was the tallest building in London when it was built. <laughs> there we go. Exactly. See, these yeah, are the yeah, kind yeah. of things that I could get away with if it was just Robin <laughs> and Martin on the quiz. Can, yeah. can I have a point for that? <laughs> I think you're going yeah. to accumulate points based on, you've probably got, a few, you've probably got two thirds at the moment. At, at least two and a half honorary points right now. <laughs> I, think, I think so. Uh, question number five. How many Oscars did Walt Disney win? Oh. Ooh. <laughs> yes, oh. Richard. One. One. There's more than one. Less than a hundred. Yeah, sorry, question. sorry, Robin. <laughs> did you pass? Oh, I, I did, but Rich got there first. Um, so more than one, less than a hundred. Okay, for closest uh, wins. I know that he's the winner of the most. I think. Um, yeah. Or nom- no, he's been nominated the most. I think he's been nominated fifty-seven times, but he hasn't won that many times. So I'm going to go for seven. Seven. Okay, Alex. Any advance on seven? I'm going to go for eight, Martin. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> no, okay, okay. I won't. I won't, I won't, I won't no, you can. Well, you can, can do that. It's fine, it's fine. It's fine. I'll go for 20. 20. Well, you get the point. It's 22. Oh, okay. okay. 22. So, Alex, you're in the lead. 2 I've, 1. I don't want to use my, my awful, horrible tactics while, while we have a guest on. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, Alex is, Alex is known for the old. Is it, what was it? The price is right, where you just say a pound more than the last person. That's exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Question number six What date is the winter solstice when it's not an Olympia? Yes, Robin. Uh, 21st of December. 21st of December is right. Hey. Well done. Wow. Question number seven. In the Harry, Pot- Harry Potter novels, what is Ron Weasley's pet rat called? Oh. Well, mm. a bunch of people are going to be screaming at the comments of this. Yeah, yeah. Yep, for sure. Uh, French champagne. Uh, yes. Awesome. Um, Scabbers? Was it Scabbers? Scabbers. Scabbers is right. Were you thinking that, Robin? Do you have on the tip of your tongue? Yeah, I, I, I buzzed because I was, yes, was going to say. Yeah, but his real name was my Peter Pettigrew. Wasn't working. I was yeah, going to yeah. say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Question number eight. Three points to Alex. You're in the lead. Question eight. In which Shakespeare play reads the line, "If music be the food of love, play on." Is... Yes, Richard. Midsummer Night's Dream. <sighs> Don't think it is. Oh, really? I thought it was that one. Okay. It's going to be a romantic one. Actually, no, it could mm. be any of them. They've all could, got you, some... could you say the quote again, please, Martin? But can you say yes. it dramatically as if I could imagine it? In, as if you were a Shakespearean, Shakespearean actor. You wear the outfit as well. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Show us your tights. There we go. Better? Okay. If music be the food of love, play on. That's quite good, actually. Good enough. That's, that's pretty good. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah. Does that help? Any any other ideas? Or? I was aroused. Yes, Richard. What are you thinking? Twelfth night. Twelfth night is correct. Hey. Well done. He's on the board. On Very the board. good. I was just going to recite all the plays and then. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, three, two, one to Alex. Question number nine: Which German field marshal was known as the Desert Fox? Oh, 
Zzz. Oh, Ooh, that was close. I think was, Richard just Richard, got there yeah. first. Yeah. yeah. Richard. Rommel. It was Rommel. Oh, he's clawing oh, this one back. Nice. <laughs> no, he's, ca- he's coming up from behind. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, question number 10 this is this is incredibly close Good question name. number 10 which class a drug i hope you know your drugs guys goes by the street names purple haze california sunshine ah, and pure love french champagne alex your dealer what are you, this is for the win i'm gonna go go for the big one go hard or go home is it heroin it's not heroin what purple haze they need to rebrand it, don't they? Yeah, they do. <laughs> yes, cocaine. Richard. It's not cocaine. Wait, wait what's the only... What's the, the only... There's <laughs> a, a few. What's, like, what's the other one? What's the hip new one? That all the I mean, this is quite good, knowing you guys aren't, aren't massive druggies, which is quite nice. I mean, Alex is straight. I, uh, I am, I just can't remember. I, it's so <laughs> <laughs> I've had so many, it's just <laughs> fried my brain. Yeah, if you... If you, if you if you if you can remember it, you weren't there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. I mean, I. Uh, I'm trying to think what the drug is in Breaking Bad. It's that one, isn't it? Mm. Uh, mm. I won't steal that clue. I'll let you remember that one because I was going to oh. say cannabis, but that's not class A, is it? It's not cannabis. Mm. Oh, it's not cannabis. It's um. It's one that's mentioned in music. It's one that's think think about think about the names for it. Purple haze, pure love, quite hippie. What do you think of this one? Oh, Alex for the win. Is it acid? Well, that's LSD, another street name LSD. for it. Oh, that's the one. Oh. That's what I was. That's what I was looking for. Acid LSD. That's the one. Well, Alex, you have won this week's quiz. Well done. Ooh, thank you very much. Does this count in our? In our no, actual totals, no, no, it doesn't. No, no, uh, no, for our leaderboard, no, 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 no very not. I think it should. because no, uh, otherwise, <laughs> <It is. no? laughs> yeah, of course it could. Hang no, on, no, Richard, does, that, could... does that mean I'm forever going to be at the bottom of the league? Oh, exactly. <laughs> no, it's not, it's not fair, <laughs> <Yeah>. on Richard. <laughs> yeah. I drew in forever more just at the bottom. <laughs> I need every win I can get. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry, Alex, this one isn't. But you do have the, uh, you know, the, the confidence going into next week. On the back of a win. I can't. That's, That's nothing to me. <laughs> but actually, you, you, you're probably actually quiz master next week, maybe. Anyway, should we go for the bonus question regardless? Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, bonus question. Closest wins this one is, as usual, as bonus questions oh. usually are. In miles, how far is it from London to New York City? Hmm. Yes, Robin. This is where my complete lack of geographical knowledge <laughs> is exposed. Seven million miles? Seven <laughs> million miles, yeah. Um, I know it's in the thousands. Okay. I'm going to say it's only 2,000 miles away. 2,000 miles, okay. It's probably wrong, isn't it? What are we thinking? Australia's probably... Ah, 2, the French... I think, it's, I think it's a little bit more than that. I'm going to go 4,000. 4,000, okay. Yeah. Richard, what are your thoughts? I'm going to go 3,000. 3,000. So what have we got? 2,000, 3,000, and 4,000? <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, Richard, it's 3,459, so you are the closest. There you go. Very nice. nice, nice. Very good. I mean, you, you, you're 459 miles short, so you're probably somewhere in the Atlantic. But, um, I'd say, yeah. But then story of my, li- story yeah. of my life. <laughs> 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 oh. oh well well done alex for your victory in this quiz and um thank you well thank you richard so much again for um thank you for coming on the podcast it's been enlightening and, and really great to see you again after after a couple of yeah. years as well after all these yeah. years exactly exactly <laughs> and, and you've not aged a bit <laughs> <laughs> i think i think you've got younger richard you look yeah i will definitely you even, look very well <laughs> yeah i'm just wearing anti-shide powder i've, I've done all <laughs> <laughs> No, thank you so much. And, and of course, Richard, where, where can we find you again, just for the, for the viewers to, to know? So it's ripperteur.com. Ripperteur.com. So head over to ripperteur.com. Um, Richard's got tons of blog posts. You've got a couple of thousand, I believe, as well as, um, as, well as books and, of course, um, some of the, the tour, virtual tours as well. So, um, so do head on over there after this. Um, and thank you so much for watching at home. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. 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 Bye.